Well, thank you, Serge, and thank you for this uh, good introduction. Um, so, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, uh, a bit sad today because we don't see each other. But uh, if you have played with the virtual games of first, it's, uh, you could maybe see some of us uh, there playing around. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. So. Uh, we, what we will do today is to present something that just happened to us uh, some, year, some, some months ago, I would say more, more, more than one even a year ago, um, about the pandemic and so on. And um, so Andras and myself we will present uh, what we did and how we, I would say, uh, uh, change a bit misspent and, and how we build the sharing communities around something that we were not expert in. Uh, so it was kind of a challenge for us at the beginning. Um, so we, we, we came by creating a kind of COVID-19 misinformation sharing community, and it was a kind of a, a experimental uh, thing. So uh, the session of today for us is, is, is a, an overview of what we did there. So first, there's a kind of cliff note about uh, MISP for the one that doesn't know MISP, but I think it will be very fast and, and quick because uh, I think a lot of the first members are already familiar with MISP and all the open source projects that we're working on. Um, but we will describe what we did exactly of, of, of building this community of, of COVID-19 community. Um, so it's not only, only about the tooling and all the uh, uh, development that we did around the tools, but it's uh, actually the, uh, I would say, even the, the relationship and the creation of a community around it. And uh, we, will, we will share uh, all the interaction that we had with the people, the different organizations and so on to really build the community. Um, and we want to really share with you, so we have a short session today of, of less than 30 minutes, but we will try to, to, to show to you what, uh, what was really working for us and what didn't work. Um, so, and we really hope to share some, some lesson learned with you. Um, so it, it's, it's really, uh, uh, what we experienced. So, uh, again, we were not experts in the, pandemic field, but uh, we became a bit in, in while, while, while doing this community. So really the, the, the origin of, 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 the, uh, of this community is like, uh, I mean, it, it was like kind of, a, I would say, reaction. Uh, so for us, a lot of things that we are developing is based on the fact that uh, when we face an issue or we are, we are facing or we are frustrated about something, we want to practically do something there, uh, which is, I think, for us, a kind of, of, of resilience uh, to create some tools and so on. And um, as a CSIRT and uh, as a day-to-day -day job, we, we have seen a, an increase of this kind of uh, surface of attack for all of those uh, um, tools, uh, services and so on run by people because they were in a rush and they were starting to like roll out a lot of new services. And uh, we have seen that it was like going up uh, at the same time, everyone has, has been human. I mean, we were facing this uh, this pandemic as a kind of new situation for for us, and I think it, it was kind of a, a new challenge, not only on the on the professional side but on the personal side too. Um, and um, at the same time, there's this kind of surrounding chaos around it, uh, a lot of uh, uh, adversaries, threat actors, and so on, are trying to abuse it. So it was kind of a uh, challenging and in all this mess of, of people discussing and so on, uh, we have seen a lot of initiative popping up about uh, sharing information and so on. So, I mean, it, it was kind of selfish for us, but we wanted to have at least uh, one point at our place where we could uh, collect the information, use it, see what are the current trends regarding not only the uh, uh, medical aspect, but all the cybersecurity aspect of, of this pandemic. Um, so, and we started to discuss with a lot of people and, uh, uh, and the, we have seen a different interest in different groups uh, regarding uh, uh, sh uh, potential sharing communities uh, on, uh, on COVID-19. So that's where everything started. So it's basically the, the origin of, of things. So we, we, we say, okay, maybe we should use MISP. And uh, uh, for the one that doesn't know, MISP, MISP is, a, is a platform, what we call nowadays a trade intelligence sharing platform. So really with a strong focus on the sharing aspect. Uh, and I, if we have to summarize the, the four key activities of, of MISP is like ingesting data, processing this data to, to for example, structuring the command format to, to allow correlation enrichment. So it's basically the classical uh, trade intelligence process or the intelligence process of that can be uh, done uh, using MISP. 
And then, obviously, you can use it to interact with people, to collaborate, contextualize, improve information, and then disseminate information. So if you're looking for a platform for uh, building sharing communities, Isaac and so on is, is basically the platform that you, you can use. It's, it's fully open source. Um, there are plenty of other things around MISP uh, that we are maintaining, uh, libraries, knowledge base, uh, many best practices, and nowadays we have even on the complete open source standard for the information sharing aspect. So everything is open source, so there's, there's no uh, hidden uh, secret there. Everything can be accessible, modified, and so on, and by everyone. And this is basically maintained by, by us. So that's just a quick introduction of MISP and what we, uh, we did there. Yeah, and a little bit more about that. Um, uh, there is also the uh, MISP instance of FIRST. So if you're FIRST members and you're, you're uh, listening as a FIRST member, just authenticate with that and, you, and it will create a user for you automatically and you can get started with. And it's already a pretty broad uh, sharing community with a lot of different users and organizations on there sharing their data. There's also something else that might be interesting. There is um, uh, also the information sharing SIG where there's a lot of discussions about uh, information sharing in general, not just cyber threat information sharing, but also other types of information sharing. So you will see here as well that, that we were dealing with different types of information sharing altogether in this uh, scenario. And we and these do come together at, at one point. We'll talk about that in a moment though. Next slide, please. So a little bit about uh, MISP uh, uh, that we also try to do over the years is, we tried to make the tool as flexible as possible. So we started out with this initial use case that we as a national CSERT, we're basically working with cybersecurity cases almost entirely. So that means that, that our background and MISP background as well is IT security first and foremost. With that said though, over the years, it has evolved on being able to host different types of communities and different types of information sharing. For example, financial fraud information is being shared in specific financial uh, uh, sharing communities. You have law enforcement using it for border control, for uh, monitoring seized goods, uh, and for their forensic cases. You have all these diff different use cases with vulnerability management, uh, and also for um, uh, risk analysis. So you have a bunch of different types of users and communities involved, and that means that the data model aligns itself with these different types of, of models. So we wanted to have this flexibility in place. If you want to see some really exotic use cases, I think the craziest one we've seen so far was uh, a sharing community where they were sharing radar waveforms. We have no idea why, but they had uh, questions for us uh, on, on how to model their data, and that's how we found out about it. Next slide, please. So going back to a little bit about the personal challenges. So Alex has already mentioned a little bit about why we started with this whole thing, but there were also a lot of personal uh, frustrations for us. I mean, one of the most common one uh, that, that I'm sure for all of you is the case was last year when it came to conferences like first, are we going to be able to travel there with COVID-19? Uh, what is the situation in given other countries where we might give trainings, where we might have to go for our jobs and so on? Can we actually travel? Are we safe? So these kind of questions were all in our mind, basically. And that's why, why we initially started. So the first use case for the COVID MISP instance was really the health information to just see where we stand with the current pandemic. Keep in mind, this is early, early last year when there weren't those fancy dashboards that are out there now uh, all over the place that you can gather this information from. The ones that were out there were either very regional, like the one uh, hosted by uh, the Chinese government, which was actually really good for regional overview of, uh, uh, within China, but not so great if you wanted to, to see, for example, what was happening around Luxembourg. On the other hand, uh, uh, the ones that existed that were good, like the one from John Hopkins at the time, didn't have the capability to do filtering on only regions that you were interested in, for example. So we wanted to have something flexible there and wanted to put MIST to good use and test this flexibility, whether it was really as flexible as we claimed it was. Uh, so first of all, we had to overcome basically uh, our own doubts and the doubts of, uh, of our surrounding about uh, us not having any expertise in this field at all. We, we knew information sharing, so that was the thing that we knew. So we wanted to apply that also to a different domain. So the, the first thing that we, we, we decided to do is to, uh, uh, to look at, at MIST and how we could track the pandemic and what we need to modify uh, in order to, to get ready and to have uh, COVID-19 MIST instance. Um, the first thing that we, we needed to do is to have a complete new data model, and this complete new data model was super simple. Um, as Andres mentioned, we uh, we have this uh, flexible model in this that we uh, we are using for a lot of things, and um, 
So the thing is know that you can describe in the data model uh, the health information because we, we were capturing a lot of things regarding intelligence, cyber security, and so on, but not the health related information. Um, and another thing that we were uh, looking for was finding the good data sources and a way to ingest them. So for example, the John Hopkins one were one of the uh, very good data sources, uh, and we were building scripts around it to be able to inject the data in there. And then there is uh, this uh, visualization aspect, like Andres was mentioning, it, I think it was quite important. At the early beginning, there were not that, that much dashboard that you can customize, uh, for example, change input, the time series, and so on uh, easily. Um, so we wanted to change that in MIST. So, uh, uh, and we had to, to modify other things. So we set up MIST uh, at, at, the, at the beginning. So we were like thinking that we were maybe only 10 or 20 people around it. Uh, but we have this uh, constant growth of, of, of users from the early beginning. We have some statistics later that you will see. Um, so we have to, to manage that. Uh, so we, we even uh, extend a bit miss to support that kind of thing. We will see that later. Uh, and another thing that we are very important to is to be able to manage uh, this kind of group uh, properly and to assign them to the proper organization and so on. Another thing that we, we, we have seen is um, we have to create what we call those kind of allo list. Um, and what was kind of kind of positive effort that we have seen around uh, the COVID-19 situation and so on is a, a lot of, of new domain names were popping up. Some were governmental, some were private initiative, some were scam. Uh, so, and how do you discuss, discuss uh, all those ones? It was quite difficult. So that was the uh, thing that we, uh, we we have to do too. And we were basically reusing some of the activities around that uh, to have some, some other list. Um, so the two main things that we, we did was uh, to uh, build uh, our own connector to gather two main health-related sources. Don't forget, it was at the early beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, and uh, only the two data sources were available and parsable and so on was John Hopkins data set and the uh, Chinese governmental reporting. Um, so we designed new object templates for those, and for the ones that are familiar with MISP, it's like straightforward to do, and you see that it was like kind of for us a quick win because we were able to reuse that model to just create the JSON uh, format. And we uh, create some additional feed ingestors. So we have these capabilities in MISP to in, uh, ingest feeds. Uh, for any kind of data, and uh, it was supporting that. So just an example here, it's, it's one of those uh, object templates that we modify in MISP. It's something that we, I remember we, we did that uh, during a, a military training that we did in Brussels. Uh, so we were two doing the training, and at the same time, we were working on the project. Uh, and we basically do those uh, uh, object templates in, in a kind of, uh, I would say, one hour. Uh, and we were structuring the COVID-19 uh, daily report from John Hopkins into a uh, uh, standardized uh, uh, misformat. And it was like a kind of quick way to have those kind of, of COVID um, object templates. Yeah. Uh, going back to what we actually lacked though at this point was really the dashboarding system. Uh, so one of the things that, that, we, that we wanted to have is something, first of all, that we can reuse later on for other use cases. Obviously, everything that we did was was also to, to still be somehow attached to what we do day to day normally. We also wanted to have a system where it was easy to build and to uh, to uh, to manage the different widgets that that we would create for the different use cases. Manage in a sense also that users would be, would be able to customize how these widgets worked uh, based on configurations, based on settings that they set up. So, for example, for the COVID nineteen case in particular. Uh, uh, I myself am Hungarian, I'm living in Germany, and I'm working in Luxembourg. So obviously these three countries were of high interest to me. So I, that means that if I'm looking at the dashboard, these are the numbers that I'm most interested in most likely, and perhaps the other neighboring countries. So I would want to create something that is catered to my own personal needs. Uh, and the other thing that you wanted is you wanted to have something that, that adheres to the rules of the release model of MISP. So the idea was that you wanted to be able to share this dashboard to all other users of, of a MISP community, and they would be able to retrieve only the statistics and overview of data that they had access to in the first place from, uh, from their user perspective. Next slide, please. So here's just a small image of what the, what the COVID-19 dashboard looked like. So again, this is very customized for the COVID-19 instance. Obviously, if you're doing cyber threat intelligence, you will have different types of widgets to pick from that make more sense. But for this, it made a lot of sense for us. We could create uh, regional hot zones basically by a, a 
the geo view of, uh, of the data. We could uh, see numbers such as mortalities, confirmed cases, recoveries, and so on, and track those numbers in the various different countries. This was at the time when these numbers really played a role in where you were allowed to travel, for example, uh, altogether. And then later on, of course, everything came to a grinding halt. But at, the, at first, I think we were a bit more optimistic uh, when we came up with this. <laughs> Next slide, please. So. To put this into perspective, uh, this entire thing for us, it, it was kind of a passion project that we also mostly did outside of working hours, so weekends uh, and evenings. And we ended up implementing everything that we needed for this first vision of what we wanted to do within two weekends and a, a few ad additional evenings. And we were actually quite surprised by how well it worked. We just put a tweet out, if anyone's interested, they can join us. And what we didn't expect was the flow of users that we received. So we had a massive influx of users, which immediately brought uh, with itself additional issues that we didn't anticipate. For example, managing user accounts and giving access in MISP in general is, is normally something that we tie to a more formal process in general uh, in other communities. Here, this was not the case. So we wanted to give access to anyone that was interested in the data, and we wanted to have something that is quick uh, in order to register. So we needed a self-registration system that was obvious, otherwise we would get overloaded. And you needed to rely on, or, on organizations and, and for users to manage themselves and, their, and give access to their peers and so on. So we basically switched to using org admins wherever we could in this case, for those familiar with MISP. That's basically it. Yeah, quick example of, of the self-registration. And this one was, was for us a quick win because uh, we were day and night working on different projects. And uh, during the evening working on that, uh, we could not handle all the requests. So uh, as Ma was, mentioning, was mentioning, it was like a kind of constant, a constant flow of user requests uh, willing to register. Uh, so now you have this kind of, of, of simple uh, self-registration scheme. And again, it's a very good, sell, I would say, a lesson learned for information sharing communities. If you give an, an easy access to your community, you will get more people and more people are involved. And uh, for us at the end, uh, introducing such kind of new features uh, help us to uh, to open this kind of functionality to other sharing communities where they have a very, I would say, lax or uh, easy access uh, to a specific sharing communities. Um, so who was initially interested? And uh, uh, initially we were uh, interested in to uh, people that uh, have information about uh, uh, health related information and so on. Um, so we, we, we get uh, a lot of people that were initially uh, interested in to this kind of dashboard and seeing the evolution and so on. But over the time, we see that those information sharing communities were uh, better, more structured. So that means a dashboard about health and so on pop ups everywhere. Uh, they, they were more coordinated, either at worldwide level, European level, and so on. Uh, so we have seen a kind of, of shift over the times where um, different kind of, of activities or at least topics were shared. One of these is, is basically health related, obviously, but uh, uh, knowing a bit of our background, cyber threat and cyber security related information was uh, something that were like uh, popping up uh, more. And then uh, two other topics were uh, very common and uh, started to really uh, take over was the disinformation aspect, because during a specific period of time, um, we have seen a lot of disinformation before that uh, information has seen has been widely distributed and, and more people have access to this knowledge about the pandemic and so on, a lot of disinformation was sent and this kind of information were shared uh, within that community. And then another thing that a lot of people were looking for was the official website to, to disambiguate the website from the government from the one that are not governmental one. And that's, the, the, I would say, four main categories, I would say, main pillar of information that we were uh, sharing there. Um, just a, a quick graph, and, and this one is interesting because you recently, re uh, quickly see a huge peak of, of, of requests at the early beginning. Uh, so we had like uh, uh, around 60, 70 people requesting access on a daily basis at the early beginning. And sometimes uh, it was like uh, a lot of people were uh, asking for requests. Then yes, yeah, this kind of, kind of slows down over the time. Um, and this one is interesting. What we have seen, we have seen a continuous request of access. Uh, recently, we have seen some organizations saying that they will stop uh, providing feeds about COVID-19 and so on. Um, but we still see a continuous interest for various reasons. We don't know what will be the state in the next month, which I think it's, it's logical. Another thing that we have seen is a lot of academics and researchers who are interested to access the system to see an overall um, historical database and data set. So um, we still give access to the uh, COVID-19 MISP instance, uh, 
um, we, we, we still give access to many people and organizations. And especially, we, we, we were surprised to see more and more academic uh, researchers um, getting access and, and using the data for more uh, uh, research. Yeah. Uh, so with that said, let's talk a little bit about these different use cases and why they were interested, what they were looking for. So starting with the health use case from, uh, from the get-go, this was the one that initially drove like the numbers of people to, uh, to join the instance initially. So again, the, we were interested in, in travel times, about the risks that we were exposed to and so on. Uh, but over time, this became a lot less relevant. So this was interesting in the beginning for, uh, for the community when there was nothing else in place. But later on, you had all these really good national dashboards and so on that you had uh, that provided way more information by having more data sources than us. So for example, later on, one of the, the, the things that became most interesting was number of vaccinations this year, for example. So this is something where national registers have the best information as opposed to these global ones, like the ones that we were using for, uh, for, for the incident cases. Uh, so this changed a little bit over time and we, we dropped the shift for uh, the focus on this uh, over time to focus more on the other uh, pillars. With that said, there was still a lot of information shared about articles, reports about the topic and so on. So it means that if something interesting new popped up, there was someone pushing data about it uh, in the community. So those interests could still follow up on that data. Next slide, please. Alex? I think we might have lost Alex or myself. Alex, are you there? Hello? Did, did I disconnect or did Alex disconnect? Yeah, he seems to have disconnected. Okay, uh, in that case, no worries. Um, um, I can just share my screen and we can continue from there. Uh, just one moment. Um, just a moment. Uh, apologies, <laughs> internet is not playing along today. Uh, share my screen there we go can you see it yes it's working okay perfect now i just need to figure out how to <laughs> go into full full display mode here um full screen mode. there we go okay so where were we sorry about that so let's continue where we left off so going to the other pillar, uh, talking about the cyber threat information sharing, obviously um, uh, what, one of the biggest changes that we saw was the change to remote work for a lot of organizations, which basically meant that, uh, that the moment you have remote work, it means that you're setting up new infrastructures for VPN and so on. And attackers started abusing this really heavily at the start. So obviously when your remote work transformation uh, project is led by COVID-19 as its project manager, uh, then you're going to end up making mistakes and things get more rushed than you'd normally something like this would happen at the organization. So with those new attack surfaces in place, uh, basically uh, we wanted to have some way of informing and mitigating these sort of issues. Uh, so this is more aligned with our traditional use case of MISP. Again, the different organizations involved were, were CSERT, SOCs, uh, researchers. There were a lot of good communities popping up specifically to to, tar, uh, to, uh, to combat uh, the situation. Like CTI League was really great with uh, pushing out a lot of good information out there. And there were a lot of vendors as, uh, as well that were integrating with, with the COVID-19 data that we had as well, and that were feeding on the data to produce it further and to, uh, to, uh, to share it further with the customers. So it was an interesting uh, change for us at the time. Also, for the disinformation campaigns, we saw quite a bit of uptake, um, especially early on when all these different campaigns popped up with anti-max uh, march, uh, marches, then later on the anti-vaxxer movements and so on, COVID denials and so forth. Uh, and often there was a lot of uh, political motivation behind this. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there was a, uh, there's a community called the COXAC Collaborative that was putting a lot of research in this. 
And they basically also started sharing information via the COVID instance. So if you're interested in that, there's a link there. I highly recommend everyone to have a look at what they do. It's really interesting stuff. They ended up also uh, implementing a lot of additional things for MISP, such as templates for uh, for social media uh, sharing, so information sharing about social media accounts, posts, and so on. So all these things are now modeled in MISP and can be reused for other use cases too. Alex, I see you're back. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, so uh, Zoom kicked me out. Um, so this information, um, so we had a lot of, of uh, group, and Sandra was mentioning Coxec groups where they were like contributing quite a lot, and, and uh, we have seen a lot of, of some early disinformation campaign, and um, I don't really want to talk that much about the disinformation campaign here, but just to show you that people were actively using uh, a functionality in MIST that were used for forensic analysis. Uh, for this information. So you see a timeline of all the uh, activities of uh, this campaign uh, using the timeline activities of the post and so on, uh, which basically is the functionality that we have in MIS for the forensic analysis. So uh, we were quite quite happy to see uh, reuse of existing functionalities in the system uh, for finding this out. Next slide, please. Uh, same with the uh, operation grid log, and this one is interesting. So if you have access to the COVID miss and uh, uh, if you want to have a look at the data set there, um, we see that there's uh, a lot of, of, of link between different groups and so on, and you can really create this kind of story behind. Um, so we have this, this uh, capabilities in MIST to uh, uh, connect the dots and, and connect those different objects uh, that have been created, for example, uh, by a different group of disinformation, uh, talking about disinformation and so on. And you can really see the story, the complete story of all, what is Operation Gridlock, what they are trying to do, and so on, uh, by just looking at one single event, and you see the overall uh, story behind. And that's, that's quite interesting to see that you can really use the technique that you use in trade intelligence for uh, describing other course of actions, and not only uh, attacks, but uh, disinformation, for example. Next slide, please. Um, same with correlation. This one is a, <laughs> an interesting one for, for uh, US uh, members at first there. Uh, it's a correlation between a, a specific uh, disinformation campaign and a specific link with the uh, account of Rudy Giuliani. Uh, so you can really see the correlation between some actors that were like actively pushing information about disinformation, and you can really benefit from the correlation automatically, and you see this kind of thing. Another thing that we have seen over the time in the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, mist is this kind of overlap and the hybrid stuff coming up of the time. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so just uh, just something else that came as a as a side note to, uh, to this. One of the things that we initially found out was that a lot of good resources were being blocked by the various different security vendors, because initially there was such a, an abuse of the COVID nineteen situation. Anything with COVID nineteen in the domain that was unknown basically for security vendors was basically blocked on a lot of tools and devices. But this was causing issues because you were blocking legitimate resources from your governments from your various different agencies that are there to inform uh, the community. So one of the, the, the initial efforts that started up was basically including a lot of these different sources as what we call warning lists in MISP. So basically these are lists that, that, uh, of known goods that, uh, that allow you to block those from being fed to your different uh, protective tools. So there are several, several really good efforts to this. There was a, one from CTI leak that was very comprehensive. Uh, Casimir's list was really useful for, for detecting a lot of these known goods and excluding those from the export. So there, there was quite a few efforts around this as well. Now, a little bit uh, quickly about some of the statistics that we've seen over uh, at the course of this little experiment, we ended up with 1,600 users from over 300 organizations uh, with over 10,000 separate data packages being shared, be it health related, cyber security, disinformation, and so on, with 3.5 million data points altogether. And with a crazy amount of peak traffic. So during the, the first few months last year, we had 15 terabytes of traffic of just uh, mis intercommunicating with each other. So it was pretty heavy. Uh, as for the uh, shift in the different topics, we saw initially there was a massive uptake of all three domains, basically. We, uh, but with this info being much more important than nowadays, ba uh, barely making it to the platform uh, in last year. So this also showed that, uh, that there was this heavy disinformation campaigns leading up to separate political events as well, as well as, uh, as also 
there being less uh, good communication from the uh, governments and so on about some of those facts that could be abused by by simply the uh, the people not knowing about uh, what's safe, what to avoid, are masks really important, and so on. Alex. Yeah, so uh, this is a reminder of Serge that you have to come in the end. So it really is a, the conclusion there. Um, so um, it's easy and straightforward, to be honest, to, to set up a new topical sharing community. Um, and if you start with very small rules and a very light way of integration rules, it's, it, it can be very, uh, a very inclusive community. Um, the thing is, it's very interesting to see that those different groups pop up at different uh, basis at regional level, local level, uh, international level. Um, and the thing is, is, for us, it was li like a huge interesting experiment to get a lot of uh, information on how to improve the platform. Uh, for, for me, for example, for us, it was a, a kind of playground and laboratories to test new things and to evaluate for the dashboard, for example, self-registration and so on. And, and for us, being open source was really a, a quick way to adapt our tools. Uh, very quickly and efficiently, uh, and have to really uh, uh, test base with with all those new users. Uh, and we have seen over the time this overlap between the different communities because a lot of things are interconnected. Uh, thing that <laughs> was a bit challenging and cause issue for us, it's uh, uh, initially we, we we wanted to group everyone into a kind of a common group and organizations, um, but uh, at the end it was better to to have a kind of specific trust user per organization. So we, we connect, we, we move those users into kind of groups, then we were able to get kind of, kind of organization-based uh, management. Uh, so we had some abuse at the beginning, but not that much. Um, so we, uh, uh, we had this kind of issue at the beginning where the, tax, uh, the taxonomy were not properly used or the classification of the data were not properly used. Um, but when we started to uh, involve people to create the taxonomies, to clearly set the data, they were, uh, doing the uh, uh, classification properly from the early on, and it was like uh, a good move. Um, so uh, the thing is, at the beginning, we had like a huge urge of people joining and so on. And for, for us, we were like uh, fixing stuff and increasing and creating new features at the same time. So we might have lost some people at the early beginning. So it's maybe something to take into consideration if you build from scratch a community when, uh, when there's an urge or an urgency to do it. Yeah, next slide. Yeah. So um, I think the, the best thing that we can say is initially, and for us, it was like kind of a, a challenge. It, you should not be afraid to really step out of your comfort zone if you create a sharing community. Uh, don't uh, be uh, worried to be agile and, and try to uh, support new type of threat. Uh, initially, we were not experts in that field. Uh, but if you look at Bellingcat, for example, they were not experts in some field, but at the end, they became experts in their own specific field. Uh, so if you start to be involved and work in a sharing community, you start, you start to learn and, and get more information. So um, removing specific controls provides freedom and people were able to collaborate and share information, especially when you have an agency, uh, people ta ta start to, to be, uh, I would say, in good mood to operate. Um, so the thing is, if you bootstrap, technically it's feasible, but don't forget about the uh, load that you might have on the community management aspect is really key and really important if you want to operate one. Um, uh, so the thing is, it's quite interesting to see that dynamic sharing communities might move into different fields very quickly. Uh, so you have to cope with that. Uh, and it's, especially in such kind of, of situations, it, it, it might, you see the topic or the threat might evolve very, uh, very fast. Even in, in the next month, you might have different topics and so on. Um, so Miss Peace, I think we, we, we had this kind of validation during this experiment that it was quite flexible. Uh, we had some uh, uh, serious deficiencies on self-registration, visualization, and so on that we overcome during the, the, the one year thing. So thanks to the, I would say the pandemic at the end, it was for us a very good uh, step to, to, uh, to improve the software and have new features. Um, so, and I think the most important part and joining what FIRST is doing on a day-to-day -day basis is really this, uh, good people uh, in the community willing to assist, help others, and so on, and to share. Uh, so for us, it was like, uh, uh, I think, a, a good sign of the humanity and people uh, working uh, for, for the, the good will of everyone. Thank you very much for, for this uh, 
uh, sessions and uh, uh, see you later in uh, Q&A.